Um, there was old Cyrus Barker, was the richest man in town. When he became terminally ill, there was much speculation among the villagers concerning the extent of his wealth. And when Cyrus died, one of the town's busybodies made it his business to run to the deceased lawyer and ask, how much money did old Cyrus leave? The lawyer replied, all of it, my friend, all of it. You know, you're not going to be able to take any of it with you, right? We want to use it for the Lord. Jesus spoke so much about treasures, possessions, finances. 16 of the 38 parables, you could look it up for yourself. 16 of the 38 parables of Jesus dealt with possessions, right? your resources, and your finance. We even find out that part of God's working in our life, that it is actually a test of your faith. Hmm. Say, Lord, I don't know if I like those kind of tests. Nonetheless, that's what his word says. He's the God that tests our faith, and he understands that in our lives that what we have can become a snare to us. Right? What we have and how we use it and how we focus on it has everything to do whether God's first in our life or second or third or whatever place we put him. How I many know he's got to be first? I'm going to talk to you about putting God first this morning. We are actually going to do a few weeks series again. We just got done with the series on uh, living to please the Lord. And in part of the series, I addressed on a few ways uh, of uh, pleasing the Lord in one of my messages there. And uh, I addressed something that we're going to take a, a bigger uh, dive into. We're going we're to chew on it some more. We're going to draw out some scriptures on it. We're going to apply it to our life. Some of you, 11 years ago, or should I say 10 years ago, were a part of a series that I did here at the church called The Blessed Life. And uh, so we're going to have a, re, um, a remembrance of that. We're going to bring some of that back to our memory. You're going to take notes. Maybe, maybe some of you got your announcements. You know on that back page, you can write down, or not announcements, you can write down notes. <laughs> not announcements, notes. <laughs> of the message. You can uh, follow along. There's going to be scriptures, and you can write those down. You can take that with you. And if you miss a message, make sure you uh, uh, go online and you can have access to the message, okay? But we're going to be talking about the blessed life because, guess what? God wants you to be blessed in every area of your life. If that's true, say amen. amen. Every area of your life. And that comes by pleasing Him. And we are going to please Him as believers on how we handle our treasures, our possessions, and those finances that we have. How do we bless and please? How do we get blessing from pleasing Him? Here's the scriptures, and we got them all up there so everybody can read them or you can have them in your, on your Bible in front of you or on your phone. Deuteronomy 28, we got two from the Old Testament and one from the New. Deuteronomy 28, 1 and 8. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all His commands, I give you today... The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land He is giving you. How many think we're blessed right now? He's given us much, right? Then Malachi 3.10. The word of the Lord. This is Malachi declaring the word of the Lord. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Malachi 3.10. Jesus, going on to this whole subject of pouring out blessing, says this. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. 
For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Luke 6, 38. Some time ago, I preached a message and I used Luke chapter 6 and those verses, and particularly verse 38, to emphasize something else of that verse. And I would, I just need to pause for a moment on that verse. We look at that verse in Luke 6, 38, and immediately our thoughts go to the area of finance and possession and treasure, right? But how many know that if you pour out a lot of criticism towards somebody, that criticism is going to come back? You hold a lot of judgment towards somebody, in the same measure you use it, it'll be measured back to you. Do you understand that this morning? Even though we take that scripture and we'll use that today and other times to, to emphasize how we handle our finances and our treasures, our possessions, our resources, realize that there's other areas of our life that the measure that we pour it out, the measure that we use it, it'll come back to us as well. God, God's plan is to bless his people. Do you believe it? To permeate every aspect of your life to bless in areas of health, to bless in areas of relationships with each other and in the body of Christ and in your family. He wants to bless you at work. Believe it or not, God wants to bless you on the job. He really does. He wants to bless you in your emotions. He wants to bless you in your thoughts. God tells us in his word that when we obey him and his word that he will bless everything to which we put our hands to. There, I mentioned already, 16 of the 38 parables speak to this issue, that there are more than 2,000 verses on the subject of finance and possessions in the Bible. More than 2,000 verses. It directly dictates many of the blessings you will or won't experience in your life. And also, I, would not, I don't want to be remiss to mention that I have resources that I use for my study. And as I mentioned all those years ago, and the book's been out for a while because it's been a while since I did the series, um, Robert Morris has a book entitled The Blessed Life. And so I've gleaned many things from this book, and I'll be sharing some things and quoting some things from Robert Morris. Uh, he, he's, a wonderful, he's been a wonderful preacher and teacher of the Word of God. And uh, many years ago, uh, being a part of this study just transformed my life and my family's life, and I believe for the church as well. It transforms our life when we hold on to the biblical principles. And so Robert Morris, it's the, the simple secret of achieving Guaranteed financial results in your life. Again, we're not looking at it this morning like, Lord, I just want to know how I can make more money in my life. That's not what this is about. This is about blessing God in obedience and seeing how he will return the blessing to us. Again, this has to do with your faith. This has to do with your faith. And we're going to talk about that in these next few weeks. We're going to talk about the principle of first fruits putting God first in this area of first fruits. It will be life-giving and liberating this morning to you when you see this. I even brought up a table. Somebody said, why you got this table up here, Pastor? Well, you'll find out in just a moment. I've got, a, I got an object lesson I want to show you this morning. God requires, let's think about some of the spiritual truths of putting God first. Because really, that's the emphasis this morning. I want to get to the heart of putting God first. Exodus 13, now we're not going to read all of these, there's too many, but Exodus 13, verse 2, verses 12 through 13. Here's the word of the Lord to the Israelites. Consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether man or animal. You are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey. But if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. Do you get the focus of what God is talking about here? He's very focused on the first. Here, in this case, the firstborn. That testifies to the truth of this, of divine ownership of God. 
divine ownership of God. By the way, just pausing for another moment and a sidestep here, um, we also believe in baby dedication here at church. So I know that that'll be happening for them as well down the road, right? Baby dedication, guys. And you know why? Because these lives are gifts from God. Those of you who had children, guess what? Those are gifts that have been given to you by God. Divine ownership. He still, they, my kids still belong to the Lord. Even though I have the privilege and the honor of raising them, they are still in the Lord's hands. How many know that's true, right? He still has them in his hands. According to the Old Testament, the firstborn was to be either sacrificed or redeemed. Let's talk about that for just a moment to get to the point. Let me share, and some of this is like a teaching, so you'll follow along with me as I, as I share these things. The firstborn animal was to be sacrificed. And if it was designated unclean, let's say the firstborn animal that they had was unclean or defected, if you will. There's a defect in that animal. Then it had to be redeemed with a clean, spotless lamb that was sacrificed in its place. In other words, the clean firstborn had to be sacrificed, but if it was unclean, then they had to be redeemed with a, a spotless lamb. Every firstborn child had to be redeemed, consecrated, set apart by the sacrifice of a spotless lamb. And, I, and I'm actually referencing here to that of a child. A child has to be redeemed. Because you see, when we're born into this world, we have what's called what? A sin nature, right? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So have you lived a sinless, spotless life? Any of you? Sinless, spotless life? Only one has done it, and his name is Jesus. So he is the sacrifice. John said, Behold, the Lamb of God that take away the sin of the world... Jesus became the sacrifice, the firstborn among many brethren, the Bible says, to redeem us from our sin and to forgive us. Are you thankful for that this morning? Say amen. amen. This is why, Mary, follow along with me, this is why Mary and Joseph brought Jesus, their firstborn, right, to the temple to be circumcised and blessed and consecrated. And you know what they did? They brought two young doves or pigeons because they were poor. And the law of God made a way in Leviticus 12 and verse 8 for them to bring these instead of a lamb because they had no lamb and some were very poor. Nonetheless, they followed the directions of the Lord and they brought their First born before the Lord to be consecrated and dedicated. You follow me this morning? Okay. Jesus was God's firstborn, clean, unblemished in every way. Jesus was clean, but we are unclean. And so again, so thankful that his sacrifice on the cross is what brought us all redemption. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Let me share a couple scriptures in Romans. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. God demonstrates his own love towards us, towards you. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, God gave his only son. Talking then about firstborn. It's for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 8, 29, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren, as I referenced a moment ago. God didn't wait to see if we would first change or repent to make ourselves worthy. He didn't. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. God knows the principle and lives out the principle of first things first. I'm getting into your spirit in this form of introduction, I guess you could say, that in putting God first comes right from the heart of God, for He did it. For you. For me. Listen. 
Giving your first to God is saying this, God, I'm going to give you first and trust you to redeem the rest. God, I'm going to give to you first and trust you will redeem the rest. An example in the Old Testament, again, is God didn't say, let your female lamb or you produce nine lambs, then give me the next one. He said, give me the first one when it came to sacrifice of the first fruits. It always requires faith to give the first. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, that all these other things shall be added unto you. This that we have and possess in our hands and our hearts and our possessions, these are all tests unto us concerning this great faith that we give Him what is due Him, the first. And so, yes, we do talk about the tithe. Malachi 3, we referenced it. The tithe actually means 10%. It means giving to God before you see if you're going to have enough. I better say that again. Maybe I'll get another amen. It means giving to God before you see if you're going to have enough. Can I get an amen from some of you? It's basically saying, hey God, I recognize you first. I recognize you first. Another example of first portions to God is, is not only in our finances, but I think about how the Lord wants the first in every area of your life. On the first day of the week, what did the church do? They got together and they prayed. I know people have jobs that have to work on a Sunday. I get that. The whole point is, is you need to give God what you can as far as first in every area of your life. Now, I love it when we can get together on a Sunday because we go back to work, don't we? And we meet with God and we have fellowship with God and we pray and we seek the Lord's face because we're giving him first. We're giving him first, right? But it can go into so many other areas of our lives as well. I, 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 look, at, I look at my time. Hello, your time. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, I just didn't have enough time today, Pastor? Man, I just don't have enough time. You know, you go all day without talking to God reading some scripture, and you say, God, I didn't have any time today? You didn't give him first. You didn't give him first. He needs the first, then everything else. You know, you get home and you're like, man, today was a rough day. Well, did you spend any time today with the Lord? Well, no. Well, no wonder. No wonder. You didn't give him the first. So it goes into other areas of our lives. Are you following with me this morning? Not just in the area of tithe or finance, but in the area of our time and all these other things. So we're talking about the first, and so it, 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 it flows into the next point. God requires the first fruits. We've talked about firstborn and how that comes right from God and talks about redemption. What about requiring the first fruits? Exodus chapter 23 and verse 19. The Lord says, bring the best or the first of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord, your God. I think it's really important to pause and say, God doesn't change who he is throughout all of human history and in the church, right? In the saints of God. God doesn't change on this principle of giving. It remains the same through time. By the way, this that we're talking about is a holy thing to God. One of the things that doesn't change about God is His holiness. Are you with me? Now, there are some things of the Old Covenant. When I talk about Old Covenant, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the sacrifices of the, of the animals. I'm talking about where they had to go outside of the camp and they were unclean. I'm talking about the erecting of the tabernacle and all of the, the delicacies and all the, the articles of the tabernacle and the temple. All those things were a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ who fulfilled it all. Right? But the holiness, everything that is holy to God has never changed from the moment 
He spoke it. Are you with me? How many think the Ten Commandments are still holy unto God and holy for us? We're living in a new day. We're living in the new covenant. This is the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for you, right? The Old Testament Ten Commandments are still true for us today. Are you getting the point? The things of morality. God's a holy God. He's a moral God. Those laws that were spoken to them about that which was morally right and holy in the Old Testament or in the Old Covenant are still true today. Matter of fact, Jesus expounded on it an awful lot. And so did the early disciples and apostles, Peter and Paul and James and others. And so this particular area as well, Jesus himself in Matthew 23 and verse 23 when he was confronted on the issue, he spoke to the teachers of the law and the scribes, and he says, because here's their issue, they were taking great pride in that they were being obedient with their first fruits, their tithe, they were being obedient with it, but their attitude stunk. He was, they, they, were, they, 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 just, they, were, they were all about themselves, they were all about the show, they didn't show mercy, they didn't show grace to anybody, but bless God, we're giving what belongs to him. And he had to rebuke him for it. So he rebuked him about that. But he says, don't forget the former. So he encouraged the tithe. What they were doing was obedient to God. But he said, you better get your stinking attitude right. Because God loves a what kind of giver? Ah, not begrudgingly, not for show, not because I have to, but because I get to. Like the woman who gave everything she had. How are you understanding it? So Jesus himself, in confronting the teachers of the law and the scribes, did not do away with it, but encouraged it, but do it with the right heart. It's all what he says in the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, man, they're like, we didn't commit no murder. And he's like, uh, excuse me, you hate anybody? He said, you committed murder in your heart. <gasps> That's why I told my kids when we raised them, don't you ever say you hate anybody. I don't want to hear it out of your mouth. I don't want to hear you hate a teacher. I don't want to hear you hate a friend. That should never come out of your mouth. The only one you hate is the devil. Point blank. You guys remember that, right? I always said that. I don't want to hear it. If I ever heard hate so-and-so, men, they'd be hauled in on that. We hate sin, right? So I'm coming back to the heart matter. It's all about your heart. And that's what Jesus was doing on the Sermon of the Mount. He wasn't saying, do away with the Ten Commandments. He's, he was encouraging it and saying, listen, it's all about what's in your heart. So, we come back to this. The tenth portion of the first fruits. The scripture designates the place for it. The house of the Lord. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament church, guess where they brought their tithe? To the house of the Lord as the proper place to give first fruits. You're here today and you're here faithfully and you're a part of this body of believers just as much as I am. And we're so thankful for ministry that happens here every week. Some of you are not as fortunate to know and to see the things that happen during the week. But like tonight, Dove, you guys have an awesome group that comes together for young adult ministry on Sunday nights. There was a day we thought, can we ever get young adults in church on a Sunday night? They're here every Sunday night. You guys have food, that helps. <laughs> but my goodness, and they're praying together downstairs. Isn't that exciting to brag about? I got young adults coming to church on a Sunday night, man. It's awesome. I'm here to pray for each other get into the word together it's it's incredible it's incredible the lights are on in the church during the week for ministry Amen. wednesday man you should see these kids that come running into this sanctuary and into this foyer excited to come to church on a wednesday night this parking lot is full of cars sometimes i've said mike go out there and help direct it a little bit right we got, we got to get some direction here. We got to make sure everybody's being safe. There's a lot of cars. It's dark. But kids are coming. Parents are dropping them off. Youth are coming. I'll even pick them up in my vehicle to get them here to church. Stuff's happening during the week. Thursday Bible study. I love it. 10.30 in the morning. 
And we fill up that blessing center around the tables. We open our Bibles and we share the word of God and pray for one another. Ministry happening during the week. And other forms of you leading and you sharing. And, and our dear sister Betty Gelka leads a Bible study at Heritage Hill. She says, oh, I wish I could get to church, but I can't. But God's put me in a mission field. And so we encourage her. She gives me her notes. You see, there's stuff that you don't see or under, sometimes understand what's happening. Some of you shared with me, you said, Pastor, during the week, I got so many opportunities to share my faith. And then you come to church, and then we feed you, and I have the responsibility as your pastor to preach you the Word of God, to preach it truth, the whole counsel of God, to give it to you and to share it with you and to enjoy it myself. And I have to preach to myself first, by the way. I won't preach something I can't preach to myself. And so I share all of these things to say, this is our storehouse. This is our storehouse. And the biblical principle in God's Word is, Bring it to his house. I'm not against evangelists and missions. By the way, we give to missions. Some of you give to missions on your own outside of what the church gives to missions. That's wonderful. We have missionaries that we support. Some 15 missionaries we support as a church. We give monthly to them. There's other parachurch organizations that some of you give to. That's all wonder. But that's not the tithe. That's called the offering above the tithe. Now, some of this I might be sharing again in the next sermon, but I, I just couldn't help myself today. We give to the house first. The lessons of the consecrated and the cursed come from the story of Jericho. We all know the story of Jericho, right? You recall that the Lord gave strict instructions that the Israelites were not to keep any of the spoils from Jericho. All of it belonged to him, the Lord declared. Why did the Lord say that all of the silver and the gold from Jericho had to be given to the Lord's house? You know why, folks? Because it was the first city conquered in the promised land. It was the first fruits. Give it all to me. Don't take any of it. It belongs to me. Bring all the silver and gold from Jericho into my house. So what it was, it was bringing it into the house, into the, the, to, the, to the, the needs of the congregation as it, Joshua is leading. He's got leaders that work with him, managing the, all the goods, all the things that came in as the spoils so it could be used for the work of the building up of the nation, of the people of Israel, and for the priesthood that was there present with them, right? He didn't say, I want you to go in and conquer ten cities and give me all the spoils from the tenth one. Once you get to the tenth one, I want the spoils from that city. He says, you give me the first before you go any further. That took faith. And it always takes faith. And so does tithing. When one man, Achan, took from the spoils... And found him, he, what happened is, he was found out and he found himself accursed. And so was the efforts of the whole congregation. And they all suffered. When they went into the city of Ahai, guess what happened? They, 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 they were defeated. They ran out of the city. They lost lives. They were run out of town. And they wondered, why, Lord? It's because somebody had stolen the first fruits of the city that belonged to me. You see, if we all walk in disobedience in this area of our lives, we're not going to be blessed as a church. We won't. We'll struggle. And as a pastor, be on my knees constantly saying, Lord, what's going on? So I don't want that to be a case for the church. I don't want that to be the case for your life. You say, why am I struggling all the time? Just look and make sure you're doing what's right. Give him the first, right? The tithe is a subject of the consecrated or the cursed. Go back and read again, Malachi chapter 3. And finally, the third point. The spiritual truth for those who put God first is that this is a requirement, this tithe. We talked about the firstborn and the first fruits, but then more specifically this area of the tithe. Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Let's go back all the way back to the beginning with Abel and Cain, will you? In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. 
Uh, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face downcast. Many people have wondered why God respected Abel's offering, but not Cain's offering. There's a lot of speculation. I've studied a lot of this over the years, some different viewpoints on it. But I'm just going to come to this point that we're talking about the first, okay? The Word makes it a point to tell us clearly that, off, that, that uh, the offering that Abel brought was the firstborn of his flock. You with me? It was the firstborn of Abel's flock that he brought before the Lord. But it doesn't say Cain brought of the first fruits of his crops. So I really believe part of that displeasure of the Lord is Abel gave first, the first. Cain just gave some when he got around to it. And let's point out that scripture in a moment. But anyway, Cain's attitude comes out, and it says here, in the course of... Oh, let's go back there. Genesis 4, right at the very beginning in verse 3. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil when he got around to it. As you live your faith out with the Lord, it's not about when I get around to it. I do it right immediately. It's what I do. Because it's holy. It's holy to God. Abel brought the firstborn of his flock. Again, as it was in the Old Testament, this holy truth is a truth that carries over into today. Because God is always about what is the first in your life. You give it to Him. Okay. It says in Leviticus 27.30, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Okay, here we go. I got a table here. I'll swing this out. All right. And uh, let's just say for the sake of my illustration that this past week I shoveled somebody's driveway. You do any shoveling this week, folks? It's melting and it just comes back again. It's, kind of, it's like, here it comes again. Okay, and I got $10. Somebody gave me $10 for shoveling their driveway. Okay, here's one, here's two. I could be doing it up here, but you guys get the idea, right? I'm laying out $1 bills. Those of you guys in the front can see what I'm doing. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, look at that. I told her at the bank, get me some really good, nice, and crisp dollar bills. Okay? All right. So, here's my, here's my earnings. I got ten one dollar bills from shoveling somebody's driveway this week. Okay? Tell me which one of these is the tithe. Austin, or Elijah, come up here. <laughs> Woohoo! Which one of these is a tithe? Is it this one? Did you lay that one first? Yeah. I can't remember. <laughs> Whatever that's one the, you laid first. No, it's not. It's not about what was oh. laid first. Oh. So get that out of your mind. Oh. Okay. 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 It it is is the tithe this one? Yes. Is the tithe this one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I got ten dollars. Here's my ten one dollar bills. You know, because you know what a dollar is. What it's a ten ten percent. You guys all know your math, right? Yeah. Okay. So the tithe. Are you ready for this, Elijah? The tithe of this ten dollars. It's laying on this table. Is the first dollar that I spend. It's the first dollar that I spend. That's the tithe. Thank you, Elijah. Okay, now here's the deal. So let's be real practical. Because Julie and I tithe. We believe, I wouldn't preach it to you and if I didn't believe it myself and been convicted of it all my life. Thanks, Dad, for raising me in this. The truth. Raised, and I'm teaching it to my kids. Right? Is we get our paycheck. You know what the first thing I do? I live in a day now where I don't like to always wait for my checks to clear. Any worth you on that? Takes a couple days for your checks to clear the bank. So you know what I do? I say, 
give me all the cash in my tithe. I want it. I want that cash. That's my tithe right off the top, and I bring it into the house of the Lord. What's the first that I spent? I gave it to the Lord as my tithe in obedience to the Lord. I wouldn't even keep it in my wallet. It doesn't even stay in my wallet. Are you with me? How many know if it's in your wallet, it's easier to spend? That tithe goes somewhere else. It gets into the house of the Lord as fast as it can come around Sunday morning. Ten years ago when I preached this message, you know what was happening? People were bringing it during the week, dropping it off to Patty in the office. They're like, I ain't going to hold on to that. That's holy. That's holy. You don't want to be like Achan, right? <laughs> it belongs to God. It's a holy thing. And here's the thing. So, by giving him my first, okay, that belongs to the Lord at the altar. All the rest of this, by the way, it still belongs to him. It all belongs to God. But because I sacrificed in obedience the first, I sacrificed in obedience the first in faith, the rest of this is redeemed by God. Hallelujah. Have you ever said, man, the money's stretched. I don't know how. I went, to, I went to get my vehicle fixed, and they didn't charge me for it. That's happened to me before. Thank God, hallelujah, that I sacrificed the first, because then God looks on favor and redeems the rest. Are you with me now? Get that in your principle. Get that, that principle in your heart this morning. It's what we do. On another whole note, we do that with our missions as well because that's a sacred thing, and we believe in that as well. So right from the top, that happens as well. But we live through life thinking, well, God, if I have enough, it's not about having enough when you give them the first because when the rest of it, you decide, you know what, maybe we shouldn't be going out to eat this week. Hello? That doesn't come before the tithe because I know how to eat peanut butter and jelly when times get tough. Ramen noodles. Well, let's, let's, you know, vegetables, fruit, all that good stuff, right? So, so I'm telling you this morning, this is a biblical principle from God that was from times past, from the days of Abel and Cain, because he gave the first, we get hung up on the covenants. Because we live in a new covenant. But the things from the old covenant that were set apart unto God as holy, that go to his morality, that go to his holiness, are carried over into the new covenant in obedience to God. Can you say amen with me? Amen. Now I lost where I was in my note. <laughs> Got to wrap it up. The first portion carries the blessing. The first portion carries the blessing. I forgot a scripture here. Romans eleven sixteen. I got all so worked up here. Romans eleven sixteen. If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. Just think about that as far as your own personal life. Abraham didn't wait to see if he had ten sons before he gave his first one. God asked for the first when one was all he had. Who are we talking about? Isaac. Abraham had only that promise of having more sons at the point that he laid Isaac on the altar. It required faith for him to do it. When God asked for the firstborn lamb, you had to give it in faith with only the promise and the hope that that female, that you, would produce more. When Satan comes against you, can you say, God will rebuke the devourer in my life, Lord, for your name's sake? Because God is first in my life, and God is going to redeem and protect everything else that is in my life. It's time to get serious about this question that we all must ask ourselves. And I, I, I'm going to bring it to a close with this. Would you rather try to make it through life with 100% of your income, but all of it be cursed? Or would you rather try to make it through life with 90% of your income and all of it be blessed, redeemed, and protected by God? That is your decision to make. That's your decision. And finally, Exodus 13, 14, and 15. He says these words. The Lord says, In days to come, when your son... I'm sorry, I got two of them here. 
when your sons ask you, what does this mean, Dad? Say to them, now I know this is Israelite history, but I know how God's been faithful to me and Julie, okay? With a mighty hand, the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed every firstborn in Egypt, both man and animal. This is why I sacrificed to the Lord the first male offering of every woman, redeem each of my firstborn sons. This is the deal to my sons that are here. And they've been raised in church and they've been raised by us. We're not perfect parents, but we've tried to do our best. Dad, why do you give that at church? Why do you do that? Because God's been so good to us. He's brought salvation to us in our household and to you. And you use it as a teaching moment so that they can understand in their own life how that everything in this life, in making sense of all of it, is realizing that it all belongs to Him and that we have the privilege and the honor and the worship of giving back to Him with a joyful heart because it belongs to Him. You see what I'm saying? So we pass that on. We have a biblical responsibility, church, to teach our next generations about what it means to give the first. Then God blesses the rest. I want you to bow your heads with me. Father, thank you so much for this word in our hearts today. Oh, Father, my heart is full today. The Holy Spirit's presence is very real here today. And God, you've had a word for us. A word for each of us. And Lord, as a word to remind us how important it is to putting you first. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, this is our time of altar and reflection. This is a time for you to look into your own heart. Where are your priorities? Where are those things in life that you seem to focus on the most? Father, we want to live in your blessing. We want to live in your blessing. We want the church to go forth in this world. We want to be blessed of you. There are souls to reach. There are lives to touch. There are families to come into the kingdom of God. There's a work to be done in the vineyard. And God, you're asking us to reach out and operate in faith and to trust you, Father, in, the, in these things of our life that Jesus himself spoke so much about when he walked for these three years on this earth. He talked about how the, pres- how the treasures and the, and the resources and the finances of life Life can become a snare to people, can keep people out of heaven. Oh God, help us to make right decisions in this moment. Help us make determination. Help us to, to reevaluate and examine for married couples, house, uh, households, to have conversation, to look at this area of their life and their family and make some adjustments and make some changes so that you can walk in obedience and blessing of God. Father, I pray that for each of us. Individually is where it starts. But in our heart, It starts by saying, God, you're the first in my life. All other things fall to the wayside. Jesus, my Savior and my Lord. Is he the Lord of your life today? Will you ask Jesus to be the Savior and Lord of your life? Say, Jesus, I need you to be my Savior. I need you to forgive me of my sins. I need you to wash me and make me whole. Jesus, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you for washing my sins away and making me whole. Are you here today and you need Jesus as Savior? I pray today that in this moment you reach out and say, Jesus, forgive me, cleanse me, come into my life and make me whole. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. And then in our life, always, whether it's your time, 
Make sure that you're spending time with God, spending time with the Lord, giving Him that part of your life and making the spiritual disciplines of your life priority. Say, God, I get so caught up in life. I get so caught up in the cares and pursuits of life. The Bible says it's like thorns that come up and they choke you. Kind of chokes your faith. So don't let that happen. Just make a decision, Lord. I'm not going to let that happen in my life. I'm going to seek you first and your righteousness. And all these other things shall be added unto me. Make that your prayer right now. Hallelujah. Stand with me this morning. Let's sing this song again, Jared. Lead us in it. Hallelujah. The altar is open this morning. If you want to come this morning, you just want to take time and kneel at the altar, you want to come and dedicate something to God, something is on your heart, you just want to make your way to the altar for a moment, the altar's open. We'll pray for you if you want prayer. Hallelujah. But let's just sing this song and worship and give this, let's give ourselves time in His presence. Let's give the Lord hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, oh, how good it is to be in your presence. How good it is to walk each day of our life. Lord, knowing that you're with us and guiding us and directing us. And, and Lord, giving us opportunity to be a light to those who need Jesus. Father, I pray today, I pray today, God, bless your church. Bless your people. God, bless our families. Lord, we are yours. All of it, all of us. And we surrender every area of our life to you. God, you love us so much. You love us so much and your word is faithful and true. Father, I pray that as we go today, that God, we go with a determination and a zeal, Father, that we're going to live a life that honors and blesses you in every way. Lord, let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be pleasing and acceptable in your eyes and your heart, oh God, we pray. I pray this blessing over each one. I pray for those at the altar this morning that their needs are being met now as they yield it all and give it all to you, Father, in their area of their lives. And Father, I, I thank you that, God, we're going to walk out of here, Lord, knowing it's been good to be in your presence today. Father, we love you in Jesus' name. God bless you as you go today. Hallelujah.